Welcome to the Mostly Legal Podcast, a show where we dive into the good, bad, and oftentimes hilarious world of legal operations. I'm Amanda Copeless. I'm the Executive Director for Sheffield, Lohman, and Wilson. And this week, we're talking to Debbie Foster, Managing Partner at Affinity Consulting. This episode is chock full of great advice, and we do learn two very important things. First, that I don't need to stop talking. And number two, an expert is just some woman from out of town. And I'm Rob Joyner, Chief Revenue Officer of Centerbase. While I tell Amanda all the time to stop talking, I didn't stop her today. Shocker. Before we get rolling, we want to thank our podcast sponsor, Centerbase, software built to power the growth of mid-sized law firms. Let's jump in. Debbie, I could give a little background on Affinity Consulting, but do you want to share exactly what you guys do? Sure. We are a consulting firm that focuses on solving big, ugly, scary problems for law firms. Sometimes those are related to technology. Sometimes they're related to how work gets done. Sometimes they're related to management and leadership and people, which also sometimes bleeds into the culture piece. But our goal is really to help law firms deliver services to their clients in the most efficient way that they can and grow their business the way that they want to grow it and have the information they need to be able to make really strong, sound business decisions. So Debbie, I always, you were one of the first people that I was told I needed to meet in legal tech when I joined the industry about eight years ago. And I remember at first, whenever I'd have a conversation with you, I'd get super nervous because you were just like this on this pedestal in my mind of legal tech and running law firms. So I'm excited to have you on today. Thanks. Thanks again for joining us. I think I'm, she's still pretty much on a pedestal. Right? Uh, I mean, let's she honest. is, but we become friends, you know, <laughs> no, it's a, I was it's a little more now, conversation. Now that you know me, I'm, I've fallen off of my pedestal. That, that not at all. Right? Not at all. I still come to you for advice all the time. <laughs> I agree though. When I first met Debbie, she was always speaking at the front of the, you know, huge audiences and she'd walk down and 30 people would, Oh, hi, how are you doing? How are you doing? I'm like, Oh gosh, she's so intimidating. But right now that we know you, you're just a regular person. <laughs> a regular person. Absolutely. And Amanda, I'd add to that too. And I want to, I'm going to ask questions about this later, but you know, Debbie will go up to these attorneys who have done things for, for a long time in a certain way. And she has this way of asking a question, just flipping somebody. <laughs> it's, it's a superpower. It's one of my superpowers. Make the change, but make sure they believe that they decided that they wanted the change and whatever we're changing, that was their idea. Hey. <laughs> you definitely have worked with lawyers for a long time. Can you tell us how you got started working with lawyers? It was quite by accident. I was uh, early on in my career, I was selling hardware, selling custom computers and uh, back in the day when we would tie coax cable to a tennis ball and climb up in a drop ceiling and, you know, launch the tennis ball to run the <laughs> coax cable. I don't know if y'all remember those days, oh, but yeah. And if one little piece of it was broken, it was like the star topology. If one piece was broken, no one could use their computer on the network anymore. And I, I loved computers. I didn't even know that I would love computers. I love them. But as we were installing computers, people would say things like, this is great. Now, how do I use the computer? And and people would get, you know, we'd install a mouse on their computer and they would be like, how do I use this thing? We'd, we'd launch Solitaire for them and say, play four games of Solitaire, then you'll master the mouse. That's actually how we legit wow. taught people how to use their mouse. Drag and drop, double click, single click. Like you learn all of those things in Solitaire. So People were asking me that all the time. And then I, I had this opportunity to leave the hardware business and start my own consulting firm that was focused on the software. And so I, I did that and I loved it. And I loved helping people find software to run their businesses. And on any normal day, I would go to a doctor's office and an interior design firm and a recruiting firm and a dentist's office and a real estate broker and a law firm. And it was kind of exhausting because I would find these software programs, be like, this is the coolest program. I'm going to go try and find other companies that need to use this kind of software. And I, I, I loved every minute of it, but it got exhausting. I'd go to the doctor's office and I'd be like, wait, that's how the dental software works, not how the <laughs> software works. And it was really confusing. And one day I was sitting at my office a couple of years in, this was probably in 1999. 
and I was exhausted. And we were sitting there at lunch and I said, what do we have the most of? And one of the women who was doing bookkeeping for me at the time said, I think law firms. And I said, that's it. Let's just do law firms. Let's only work with law firms. And she was like, are you crazy? What do you mean? Not, like, how would we even do that? I said, well, we're going to market to law firms. Like, we've got some great law firm clients. I'm going to ask this client and this client and this client for referrals. And we're just not going to take anyone new unless they're a law firm. And it took us a couple of years and we found other homes for our clients that weren't law firms. But it was the right decision and it was quite by accident. And looking back, I, it was an accident, but I don't have any regrets. And so you didn't go to college for this. You were an EMT at that one was, point. That is that is true. I mean, that was, um, I, I have the utmost respect for every first responder, firefighter, EMT. But for me, that was a decision that was made because there were hot guys that drove a fire truck into the <laughs> Win dixie parking lot. Amanda signing up. I need to turn in my two weeks notice. <laughs> <laughs> so but seriously, I was like, wait a minute, if I was a firefighter EMT, I could spend one out of every three nights in that firehouse with those hot guys. Where do I find <laughs> up for this? I'm not even kidding you. I mean, I, you know, I did go to EMT school. I was a volunteer firefighter for several years. I have run into burning buildings. Uh, I drove an ambulance. I, I've done all of those things. But then I met my husband and it just wasn't really a great idea anymore. And I never did it for the right reasons. So, but I do say that my triage skills that I learned back then helped me when some law firm lawyer, someone calls me and says, this is an emergency. And I say, actually, that's not an emergency. So you went from running into burning buildings to running into burning law firms. Got it. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Some transferable skills for sure. Do you have any like short, wild stories from your day as an EMT? I have a lot of short, wild stories. The ones that are coming to mind that are most memorable are really, really sad stories. But I will tell you one okay. story, um, one story that is a really positive story. I went on a call one time. We have a little fishing village, touristy place called John's Pass where I live in Madeira Beach, Florida. I don't live in Madeira Beach, but it's a community close to me. And we got a call for a woman who, a pregnant woman who thought she was in labor. We get in our fire truck, our ambulance at the time, and, and go down there. And she is laying on the boardwalk in John's Pass. And she's like, I can't, it's the baby's coming. And we were like, all right, clear the, clear the space. We had police officers who came and cornered all, you know, got everybody way, way back. So she could, you know, lay down and like pull up her dress and spread her legs and have a baby. And no one was actually watching. And it happened right like in the sunshine on a boardwalk. I mean, I remember trying to get her to be able to like put a sterile pad underneath her. So she, cause she was literally sitting on the filthy, dirty boardwalk. Oh um, and God. she had a baby, a beautiful, healthy baby girl. And I will never forget like the tears streaming down my face when that baby cried and, wow. and we gave her to her. And so it was, that was a, that was a good thing. Thank you first responders. Cause there's a lot of hard things that come from with that job too. But sometimes there are little stories like that, that just bring an incredible amount of joy to people. So Debbie, these days when you're working with law firms, transitioning back, we have a lot of legal operators that and administrators that are listening to this podcast, what are the first things people are asking you these days when they call? And how has that changed over the past, you know, 20, 20 plus years? I tell people that I spent the first 10 or 12 or maybe 14 years of my career trying to convince lawyers and law firms to buy technology. And I will spend the rest of my career teaching lawyers or encouraging lawyers or helping lawyers and law firms to use the technology that they own. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting about what I hear more now than ever is people coming to me and saying, I don't want you to just, I don't want to just tell you about this one problem I have and have you help me solve it. I really want to come to you and say, help me create a plan. We want to work on our strategy. 
what we want to do with our technology, what we want to do with our people, how our associates become non-equity partners and then equity partners. Should we grow? Should we shrink? Should we bring in a lateral? What do you think about our partner compensation? What do you think about uh, this particular practice area? What do you think about reporting? And should we think differently about our key performance indicators and what makes us successful? And many of the calls that we get now are about strategy. And, you know, technology is a tool. Everyone needs the right tools to do the job. There's no doubt about it. So it's pretty rare that I'm working with a firm and we don't talk about technology at all. But what I love is that it's not just about the technology anymore because there's so much more to it. And I, as I said in the beginning, I want to help lawyers be able to deliver amazing services to their clients. I want them to be able to create raving fans out of their clients. And that comes from how they communicate, how they collaborate, how quickly they can get their work done, how efficiently they can represent that client. And I know that we can help with that, not just from a technology perspective, but from a strategic perspective. So I love that that is the direction that our business is turning. Debbie, you just listed. Go ahead, Amanda. Nope, it was my turn to ask a question, but you go right on ahead, Rob. <laughs> well, I was going to say. I needed that banter, you guys. I, I've, I've heard your show. Like, I, I need the banter. Let's go. Uh, a week together. I'm just worn out by Amanda. We were together for maybe four it hours felt like a month. over the course of three days. <laughs> Wait a second. If you were only together for four hours, I was with you for like five of those four hours. You were. Hours. Okay. You were. Okay. Yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> we avoid each other other than that. So Rob, go ahead, ask your question. Well, I was just going to ask, you know, you listed off a ton of stuff, Debbie, in, in the ways you guys come in and, and work with law firms. Is there one thing that's pretty common? Like, what would you say that one thing is that you get in there and you're like, yep, seen this before. Here's how you fix it. Well, that's pretty much everything. Um, and <laughs> pick one, but all law pick firms one. are different. Uh, right. I know we're all unique. Everybody's a we're snowflake, right? Yeah. You know, Rob, honestly, every single thing is connected. When someone says to me, I want to talk about our strategic plan. And I start to ask them questions about all of those things I listed off. Every single one of them is part of their strategic plan. For example, someone called me and said, I'd love for you to help us. We're struggling with retention. I'd love for you to help us with attracting and retaining talent from associates to paralegals. And we got on, we got to talking about associates and, you know, billable hour requirements and client management requirements and business development requirements and path to non-equity partner and equity partner, and then partner compensation. And the lawyer that I was talking to said, well, we don't actually want to talk about any of that. We just want to talk about bringing in the right associates. And I said, I'm not your person then, because you can't like the days of I'd like to have a job where I punch a time clock in and punch a time clock out are over. The lawyers that are coming in now, they want to know what what is the potential? What does the future look like? How will I get paid? How are you going to help me learn how to be a rainmaker or a business generator? Every one of those things is connected. And while maybe I could talk to them in a vacuum about their technology, like let's help you learn how to use this technology, oftentimes what the pushback that I get there is the problem with our technology implementation is that some number of lawyers or partners don't feel like they have to use it. (laughs) Well, that's not a technology problem. That's a leadership problem. So now here we go. Please bring me to your executive committee. I'd love to sit down and talk with them about the importance of buy-in from the top. Otherwise, you're literally lighting dollar bills on fire. It, It doesn't make sense. So I wish I could tell you one thing, but even if they come to me with one thing, all of the things that I will ask them about next are related And oftentimes, honestly, something that they're like, nah, I really don't want to talk about that. Hmm. Amanda, why'd you laugh so loud? (laughs) I refuse to answer that on the grounds that it may incriminate me. Um, (laughs) I mean, look, I've been in law firms for a long time and adaptation of technology from the top down is not a unique problem. And we joke about all law firms are unique, but that is not a unique problem. So I I just laughed because Debbie's just, she's always right on point. She's always right there. 
So following up on your comment about attracting and retaining talent, I mean, that is such a hot button issue right now. And I heard, you know, we keep hearing the great resignation, the great resignation, and I heard it called the great reshuffling Mm -hmm. not too long ago. And I thought that was actually more apropos because really it, it is people kind of getting fed up and leaving and going to a different place. So the question is, how can we attract and retain talent? And that really is not just attorneys, but staff as well. Yeah, it's such a great question. And it really is one of the questions that we're getting asked the most right now. And honestly, there's such a conflict between how law firms have always done it, the period of time that was COVID slash pandemic, and this period of time where we're kind of coming out of it. And I I was just at a, a board meeting for one of my clients a few weeks ago, and we were talking about flexible workplaces. And they had recently lost two associates because they said no associates can work from home. No associates, no paralegals, no support staff can work from home. Only partners can work from home. And we we had a really great conversation that I think ultimately is going to end up with them adopting a hybrid workplace policy that has some guidelines and some limitations that they're comfortable with. But honestly, if we don't provide the healthy workplace, the thriving workplace where employees are engaged, where they get their needs met, even if those needs are about flexibility, There are nine or 12 or 23 other law firms right behind yours that will provide that. And I I really think that this race to understanding the value and importance of culture is something that law firms are going to need to be focused on. If I'm an associate, I want to know what my future might look like at this firm. And If I've been an associate at this firm through the pandemic, I've probably had greater flexibility than I've ever had before. And I don't want that to come to a screeching halt. This, you know, concept of work-life balance or whatever you want to call it, but the fact that people were able to be home when their kids got home from school, or they were able to cut out and go to a a soccer game and they, they didn't miss out on those things that two years ago, they probably would have just, it would have just been their lot in life that they had to miss out on it. They're not missing those things now. And I think that's something that is is hard for the boomers and the traditionalists. And I don't mean to paint with a broad brush because I'm sure there are plenty of progressive traditionalists and boomers out there who are running firms with very, very flexible workplaces and considering things like flexible work time, not just working from home and you know how PTO and, and time off kind of factors into someone's work-life balance. But many of the firms that we work with are struggling with the desire to go back to the way that things were. And that is really tough, that it's tough to figure out how to balance that. And, you know, you guys know you've been in law firms and Amanda running firms that that whole idea of if they aren't sitting in the office next to me or the cubicle outside my office or the office down the hall, how could they possibly be working? You know, my response to that is, how do you know that they're working when they're in this building? Like, I, you don't. Like, I, it's just I can like, assure you they are not. <laughs> exactly. It's like a false sense of security. If I make them drive 20 minutes or 40 minutes or an hour or whatever that looks like, if I make them drive here and they're sitting in a chair that is in close proximity to me, they must be working versus working from home when they're doing the laundry. And I mean, it's just kind of crazy, but it's something that... I think is when it comes to attract and retain, great place to work, a thriving culture, and meeting people where they are from a flexibility perspective, I think is one of the most important things that firms should be thinking about right now. Debbie, do you see like a, a specific policy working in these firms? For instance, you know, total flexibility or just flex on certain days, what's working, what's not? I think that what works is having a policy and a policy that is adopted by and believed in by all policies that create the class system like these can and these people can and these people can't are problematic. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that with our especially in the last couple of months, 
seen how that has not served firms well. I think that firms struggle too because there are some positions, like if you work in the mailroom or office services or you're the receptionist, there's a lot less opportunity for you to have that flexible work environment than if you're a paralegal or an associate or an attorney at the firm. So I think that it has to be position specific and I think there has have to be realistic expectations. I think communication is absolutely key. And I would also say, you know, my company has 70 employees and in they're in 23 or 24 different states. And very rarely are multiple people in the office together. And that has been true for us for 10 years. And we've we have managed to create an amazing culture even though we're not all in the same place. And so I say that to say it takes a lot of intention to build a culture around people who are not going to pass each other in a hallway. It's not that it's not doable, which is what a lot of firms think. Well, how will we ever have that collegiality? <laughs> You'll definitely have it. Just be intentional about how it works and what the rules are. And it absolutely can happen but it is a struggle to get people to think a little bit outside the box. So Debbie, for a company like Affinity, what tools are you using to collaborate remotely and any of those that you would recommend putting into law firms? Oh boy, I could go on for days with this question. <laughs> so one of our best tools is called Bonusly. And Bonusly is an employee engagement platform, and we've used it for probably about six years. And uh, it's a, a web tool, and at the beginning of every month, every one of our employees gets 750 points. And the goal is that they would give those 750 points out to their coworkers throughout the month. So if you do something great, like if I see you interact really well with a client, I might say, Amanda, 50 points, hashtag have grit, and just write, wow, that was a tough conversation and you got through all the way to the end without uh, wanting to rip your hair out. You can add <laughs> gifts in there. It's, it's just, it's a really cool way to do it. We acknowledge birthdays and anniversaries and last Friday was Employee Appreciation Day and we acknowledge that there. But for me, it's almost like as a, a, a leader, I go to Bonusly and I am so dang proud of every single person in our company stepping up and giving people shout outs for doing great work or helping them when they needed help or even sometimes the funny ones where you get one point, like that's kind of like a no point, one point, you know, oh, thanks a lot for showing up for that call yesterday. We handled it without you, one point. Um, but, you know, that's like what I would give you, Rob, for this podcast. Right. I knew you were going to make some kind of joke. <laughs> but it's it's fun stuff like that. So that is one tool that is just and then with, the, with their points, they can cash them out. So they can cash out to PayPal or they can get Amazon gift cards or they can get a Nordstrom gift card or they can donate. Like right now, there's a big push to donate to the Ukraine and we can choose to match that. So we often do campaigns around however many points get given to this organization. We'll match the points. Just fun stuff like that, that uh, really get people socially interacting, even though they're not in the same office. We also have a program called Engagedly that where we manage all of our, our reviews and our feedback and our we do regular check-ins. So every team lead does a check-in. It's a little reminder and it asks you like five questions, things like, how are things going from a work-life balance perspective? Anything really challenging on your plate that I can help you resolve? It's just these automated check-ins with our people. And it also has pretty much every single thing you could ever want to know about Affinity all in one place. So if you want to know about our health insurance, you click there. If you want to, you can get a link to Bonusly there. You can get a link to our health and wellness reimbursement there. It's like an internet, but it has this automated component um, around checking in with people and doing reviews. So, and then of course we run almost all of our meetings on Zoom or Teams and almost every single person is on video. It's just become a normal part of what we do. And one last thing I'll say is we have got 
meetings down to a science. I'd say one out of every 25 of our meetings might go off the rails, but our meetings are very scripted. There's an agenda for everyone. It starts off with personal and professional good news. So whoever's in the meeting, um, someone, whoever's leading the meeting will say, Debbie, personal and professional good news. And I'll say, my professional good news is that I was at ABA Tech Show, was able to connect with so many people I haven't seen in a while and our great partners. And it was just time really well spent. And my personal good news is when I fly home from New York on Friday, I am going to my daughter's house where I get to spend the weekend with my cute little grandbaby. And then we move on to the next person. And that gives everyone an opportunity to talk about something good professional that just happened and also something personal because what will happen after next week is someone will say to me, did you have a great weekend with COA? Because they know that I was there and it just lets us connect at a different level. So those are some of the tools we use. Like I said, I could go on for days. Those, I mean, I'm like super excited. I'm sitting over here taking notes because those are programs that I think a lot of us are looking for. Our payroll software has functions like that, but we're not getting wide adaptation of them. And mm -hmm. it, it, it doesn't hit a lot of these things that you were talking about with the points and the check-ins and things like that. We'll put both of those in our show notes on our website as soon as the show is live. Debbie, we've done the same with the personal and professional good news. Oh, I and love it. It's, it's been, yeah, it's been really nice just to connect with different people. We're all going so fast mm -hmm. that it just kind of forces you to take a step back and listen and learn about somebody else on your team. Yeah, I love it. It's such a great tool. Debbie, shifting gears, when you first started talking about everything that Affinity does, you have this kind of wide net, right? Because you're solving the big, scary problems. And for law firms, that can go from, you know, top to bottom all day, every day. How do you narrow what your company is going to do? Or how do you expand the scope? And how do you do that purposefully? Oh, well, it's a, an ongoing question here because we do regularly internally have the conversation that we do a lot of things. And sometimes a visitor to our website, someone who works here calls it the Cracker Barrel menu. I'm not, no, she calls it the Waffle House menu. <laughs> I was going to say the, the cheesecake, the, the cheesecake, cheesecake factory. factory. Exactly. The cheesecake factory menu. Right. Yeah. Like how can you guys be good at that many things? And, you know, the answer for me is that not all of us are good at all of those things. That's why we have different teams of people who do different kinds of work. For me, I like to start every engagement with one of our strategic uh, offerings because it's like a lawyer does discovery, right? You're not going to take my case and just be like, I'll learn the facts as I go. That's the worst way to manage a litigation case. And I look at every project that we work on as complex because there's a lot of different moving parts. So for me, when someone comes in and says, I really want to work with you on a strategic planning engagement, or we have a, a product that we call a practice analysis, which is where we come in and it's some strategic, but it's a lot of focus on how people get their work done. What tools are they using? How are the different silos? Because, you know, most law firms have some silos. We do things one way, they do some things another way. And just really kind of get a handle on how work is getting done. So we cover everything from how do you get new business? How do you keep track of that new business? How do you open up matters, conflict checks? How do you track deadlines and calendars? How do you manage time entries? And how do you deal with expenses related to the clients? And how do you manage pre-bills and bills and trust accounts and accounts payable? And how do you close files? How do you save documents? How do you collaborate on them? I, I mean, we go through front door to back door, how you get work done. And from there, we do some deep dive sessions, really trying to understand exactly so many times what we hear initially are all the symptoms of the problems. I want to I want to actually understand the problems. And so we do some deep dives understanding the problems and then we come back to a firm with a recommendations report. And that's how our scope typically expands. So it's either a practice analysis, which is we're kind of working with the people 
or it's a strategic planning engagement where we're working with the leaders of the firm on what are your hopes and dreams for the future? What do you all see as the problems with a little bit of feedback from, uh, you know, the, the people who are actually doing the work. When our engagements start off with one of those projects, I feel like we become the trusted advisor and not the net documents implementation people or the center base implementation people. And a lot of times implementations come from those engagements, but I want people to know that we're there to help them at a much higher level, not just to remove the software program they're using now, forklift all their data out of it, dump it into the new system and say, <laughs> here you go. Good luck. Because that's, that's just a, that just doesn't ever work. Forklift, dump truck. Got it. <laughs> <laughs> it's <laughs> as somebody who has gone through software conversion, I can assure you it is heavy construction. So that's how we became friends. Yeah, right. friends. That's air you quotes. Know, we, <laughs> air we, quotes. Always, uh, we friends. You guys, you guys are like that. The you know what? I'm just going to tell your secrets right now. These two are like BFFs. They they banter um, like this, but they like they take a bullet for each other. That's what I love about you guys. It'd have to be like a water balloon bullet, like. <laughs> But just not, Amanda, I, I was waiting for you to. <laughs> Amanda, I was waiting for you to come back and say, "Hey, as long as I'm getting something out of it." <laughs> Rob, you know I I love you, but you don't have an altruistic bone in your body. Like now, you and I are every... very similar. I think that's why uh, we get along yet banter at the same time. <laughs> uh, okay. So so Debbie, on the heels of <clears throat> the last question, your answer. I know tech does not solve all the problems, but. As you're going through doing these, these, uh, as you're looking into these firms, talking to firms, understanding process, are you seeing any trends as far as like the legal tech or tools people are asking for? Are they asking for, for instance, new types of features, um, things that they weren't before? Could you, could you speak to that for a second? Yeah, I mean, I think that firms definitely are still in the how do I get to the cloud mode? And it's like, how do I completely get to the cloud, right? They might have signed up for a subscription to something, but now they're like, wait, but now that's in the cloud, but I've got all this other stuff over here. So I think strategic planning around how do we get to the cloud is one thing. Mm -hmm. I also think that the, the way that the work gets done, right? So when we're talking to people about things like calendaring or deadline management or document automation, we often find that they are still doing those things the same way that they did them five years ago and 10 years ago. So they're not just looking for what we call the three C's, cases, contacts, calendar in their software program. They're looking for what's beyond that. How can I really take advantage of the software that I have? How can I, are there features that I'm not taking advantage of. And for anyone listening, the answer to that is yes. Doesn't matter. You don't even <laughs> have to tell me what program you're using. In Word, there are things that would revolutionize your life if you learned about them or even in Outlook. So I think that there is a this, you know, thinking differently about how to leverage the technology you already have is something that we're getting a lot of questions about. And we're working with our clients from an implementation perspective on a, what do you need to get you started? Let's get everyone used to that. Kind of the crawl, walk, run thing. What do you need to get started? Get used to that. And then what's the next thing? Maybe we're gonna automate your documents next, or maybe we're gonna take one practice area and put together a really powerful workflow and just kind of bite it off in smaller pieces instead of trying to build something behind the curtain, have everybody log in on a Monday and say, ta-da, and everyone's like, no. That's not how we do it. That's not how it works. That's not going to work for me. And that's, that's a really frustrating and challenging part about technology implementations. So I think the you know slow implementation and making sure that there is alignment with all of the different products that a firm is using. So we're not entering data duplicatively. Is that a word? I think so. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we, we've got that alignment and integration between the different products that people are using. And I think that you talk about leveraging technology and really getting the most out of your technology. That is uh, one of the things to really focus on. I think that a lot of this comes down to something I struggle with on a daily basis, and that is communication. And 
something I ha- I struggle with even more is communicating with attorneys. And I don't like lumping them all into one, you know, personality type. But what do you see as the most successful way of communicating with attorneys that people who work for them in legal operations or from Rob's side that are selling into law firms, what can they do better? What are some tips and tricks in that area? So I think the first thing is to just really listen and ask questions. You know, that is one of, I I said before, you know, my superpower is being able to get people to make changes without saying, hey, you need to make this change. And I do that by listening and asking a lot of questions. I ask a lot of what if questions. And, and I'm not afraid to challenge people on those what if questions, you know, what if, I mean, if you were really thinking about the most efficient way to do this, what if we thought about automating that document? And the standard response would be, it's so custom for every single person, there's no way we can automate it. I say, okay, what if, which by the way, that's not true, but I know having um, worked with people at your team, I can assure you that is not true. (laughs) That's not true. But I say, okay, all right. So what if we were to automate 50% of it? Because all I really need to do is get them to buy into automating some of it. And then we can, we can understand what the path forward is to automating all of it or the 95% of it that needs to be automated. So I think that for anyone who is working, whether you're inside the law firm, because Amanda, you know, I'm sure that you have paid consultants to come in and sit around a table with you and say something and your lawyers are like, oh my God, that's exactly what we should do. (laughs) And you're sitting there like your tongue is bleeding Because you're like, I've been saying that for three years. No one listens to me. There's like a Mark Twain quote about uh, an expert is just some guy from out of town. (laughs) I think that's really true. I, I mean, I have definitely found that to be true. But sometimes that third party perspective, sometimes validation that what you're saying, actually, you know what, that might work is all that people need to just kind of be pushed over that line. I think you're right. I think you've definitely hit the nail on the head. I'm very fortunate that I have, I'm currently working for a firm where they do listen when I speak, but I have worked in places in the past where that is not the case. And so I encourage fellow administrators or people in this position to use consultants like Debbie to not only bring answers into your firm, but also to train you on how to to get that seat at the table, right? Yeah, like don't stop talking. Even if you feel like people aren't listening, don't stop talking because you never know when like- Do you hear that, Rob? She said I shouldn't stop talking. (laughs) You don't have that problem. (laughs) But you never know when like the right intersection of, of content and context happens, right? What you say and when you say it and what's going on for that other person when you say it is the context piece. You never know when you're going to hit that perfect intersection and someone's going to hear you differently than they've heard you before. And and I think, too, ask a lot of questions. Uh, you know, the, the listening part of my job and listening, listening is hard for me. I have a sticky on my monitor, on every monitor in my home office and my monitor here and at my daughter's house where I work. And across the bottom is a post-it that says, shh. It's like lots of S's and lots of H's because I do have a tendency to talk and you learn so much more listening. Now, as I say that, I see the timer on here is like 41 minutes and I'm pretty sure I've been talking for 39 of them. So I only came back for season two if Amanda spoke less. I'm going to check my mail tomorrow and there's going to be a FedEx package with about a hundred post-it notes that just say, shh, I just, that's, I know Rob's already putting it together um, or assigning it to someone to put together knowing Rob. Okay. Bingo. So that's funny. That is as somebody funny. who saw Rob force his people to go and get him a Rice Krispie treat and a bottle of water because he didn't want to leave his booth this weekend, I can assure hold you. On, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I am not getting that- called out for that. Is hilarious. The only reason that happened was because somebody could not wake up on time. So instead of screaming at him, we just assigned him terrible tasks. Great management style. I love it. 
So Debbie, thank you so much. We wrap up every one of our episodes with a little session we like to call Pitch Your Passion. And we give you a few minutes to talk about whatever it is you're passionate about. It could be your grandson, but no, I'm just kidding. What would you like to talk about? (laughs) So I would like to talk about, uh, am I allowed to have two passions if one is quick? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. So Amanda, you mentioned earlier, you said you didn't go to college, you were an EMT. And I think that I would like to make my first passion is that I'm sharing that much more openly than I ever have before. You know, being a a female in legal and technology has not always been easy. Being a female without a college degree or some level of even higher education than that, like most of the lawyers that I work with, and no certificates. I'm not an MC, CISM, PL, JB, PMP. I don't have any of those letters behind my name. Has been a challenge. And I know that there are a lot of other people, especially women and men, probably too, running law firms, who are in this same situation that they do not have a formal education in anything that they currently do, which is certainly my story right now. And I think it's important that we talk about that. And I think it's important that we own that. I I was at the Mile High chapter of the ALA uh, last week or the week before, and I did a presentation on imposter syndrome and claiming your seat at the table. And I think it's important, especially for women, to show up and claim your seat at the table, to not stop talking, to listen carefully, to ask the right questions, and not to have the fact that you don't have the same number of diplomas hanging on your wall as the person who might be in the office next to you. And I think that is a real challenge. And it was the first time I had done that presentation live. I'd done it on Zoom before. It was the first time I'd done it live. People came up to me afterwards and that evening and were in tears saying, I'm so embarrassed. I feel like when I'm having a conversation with someone, I'm about to be found out. And when they find out that I don't have a degree, they're just going to disregard me. And I think it's a way bigger problem. So I'm, I, my mind is kind of racing with some things that I think that I could do even just within our profession to help people deal with that. That's number one. I'll pause there for a second. I don't know if you all have any comments about that, but that's well, the number one. I, I, we're not supposed to interrupt on the picture passion, but somebody once said to me that they've noticed that I will a lot of times read my resume the second that I meet somebody new, right? I'll name drop education. I'll name drop certifications. And I, I had never really realized I did that until I this person pointed it out to me. And I thought, you know, that is, I do that because I feel like I am constantly validating Mm. that I deserve to be where I am and that I deserve to be heard by people I work for because I spent time in education and I spent time on, you know, test. And so I have a hundred percent struggled with imposter syndrome. People talk me down and talk out the gremlins out of my head all the time, but you are exactly right. I that is kind of my default to prove my value. Yeah. And I think that, you know, for a lawyer, it's not uncommon for a lawyer to meet me and say, where'd you go to school? Once I kept a spreadsheet for many years about how many women were sitting in first class on an airplane. And those numbers are unbelievably low. One time. So I think I should keep a spreadsheet about this because I would say, One out of every three lawyers that I meet in person, like when we're making small talk, will say, where did you go to school? And, you know, when you went to school, when you went to college for seven years and then you took this big, gigantic exam to do what you do, it's school's probably like front of mind. Right. But it's always a question that when someone asks me that I feel like even I have a I am accomplished and I am proud of every single thing that I've done, but I'm not going to lie. When someone asks me that question, I feel like four inches tall. It's, it's really tough. Of course, I never ask anyone that question ever. I've literally never, those words have never come out of my mouth. You can understand why, but I think it's important to think about that. You know, we don't know what anyone's story is or what their journey looked like or how they got where they are. So, um, you know, school's one way to do it. College 
higher education is one way to do it. And you can bet your bottom dollar. I said to both of my kids, I don't care. You can get C's. I, I actually don't even care what your degree is in, but you will have a college mascot. Like just, you're going to do that because it, my life was absolutely harder because of it. So the second thing I will say um, is that I am all about culture and great place to work. And I know, you know, whenever I, when I was thinking about this picture passion and I've had a while to think about it, uh, when I was thinking about this, I was like, can't I think of something? Don't I volunteer for any amazing organizations or, and I don't, and I should, so I'll just fall on that sword. But I really feel like law firms being a great place to work is a mission for me. And many of them are not. And it's probably true across every kind of business, but I only work in law firms. And no one ever calls me and says, everything is great here. We'd love for you to just pop in and make sure that you know we're doing all the right things. So I admit, I most of the time am, go, am going into law, law firms where they want me to help them solve a problem. But I think that my I can and my team can make such an amazing impact from a law firm perspective when it comes to great place to work and a thriving culture and a place where people want to go to work and they feel like they're making a difference and having lawyers be better communicators of their why that they're not just doing what they do to make money. They're doing what they do because they can help people and they help people in the worst of times and in the best of times. And I really want law firm staff to be keyed into that why because I think that it's fulfilling personally and professionally when you go to work to know that you are part of a system that is helping people. So my pitch, my passion, the second one is I want law firms to be a great place to work and I'm going to do everything in my power for the rest of my career to make that so in as many law firms as I can, wherever I can help. I don't even know how to follow that up. <laughs> I'm supposed to close this out. I've just been sitting here listening. Debbie, it's been amazing having you on today. And I just want to say, you know, thanks for joining us. Uh, until next time. It was my pleasure. I'm, I really appreciate y'all having me. And I can't wait for the rest of season two of the Mostly Legal Podcast. Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Mostly Legal Podcast. If you like what you heard, make sure you like and subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. You can also check us out online on MostlyLegalPodcast.com, where you can sign up for our email list, get weekly recaps, and get some of your very own Mostly Legal swag. Mostly Legal.